So our final panel of today's meeting and the final session for open session NASAD is innovations at the state level. So this is a real opportunity for the members to show some of the innovations that have been happening at the state level. And uh, we have four panelists that will be discussing some of their innovations today. So first we have Karen Brinson Bell from North Carolina, who you've already met earlier today. And then we have Blake Evans from Georgia, who also joined us earlier today. And then we have Wayne Benna, who is from Nebraska, and he was named Nebraska Deputy Secretary of State for Elections in September of 2017. Prior to accepting this role, he served as Election Commissioner of Sarpe County, Sarpe County for eight years, giving him a unique view of elections from both the county and the state perspective. And then we have Mandy Vahil, and she is the election director for the state of New Mexico. And Mandy has served as the state of New Mexico's, uh, uh, as a public servant for the state of New Mexico for 17 years. In the past 12 years, she has established her career in the office of the Secretary of State in supporting and overseeing the election programs. She previously spent time advocating for consumer protection at the office of the Attorney General, as well as legal research and administration in the judicial branch. So, so pleased to have you all here today and excited to hear about uh, your innovations. So please take it away. Thanks, Megan, and thanks for asking me to present again. Um, our innovation is not the number of acronyms we've been able to come up with. Um, but here's another acronym from us. Um, our ARCs are ready. ARCs being attack response kits. Um, and that's what happens also when you give me too much time in the car. Um, how do I go back? There we go. Uh, so yes, this idea um, somewhat came about uh, by circumstance, unfortunate circumstance. In February of 2020, we had already begun uh, sending out absentee by mail ballots for our Super Tuesday, March Super Tuesday primary, when a county government, uh, the whole county government operation was under attack. Um, they had just lost their IT director to cancer and uh, had no new IT support in place. It was a very rural county, um, small county, actually my home county, so it got kind of personal too. Um, and it just, it shut down their phones, it shut down their computers, it shut down everything. Um, and so with that going on, we had to figure out how to still get their absentee ballots out. Luckily, um, that community is only about 80 miles from our state office. So for the first few days, they just traveled up and uh, we worked with them to get their, their materials out. Um, but that couldn't last, and we had to figure out how to get them operational um, by election day, if possible, um, because they were looking at, uh, you know, response to this kind of attack was going to be over um, not just days, but, but probably weeks. So at that point, you know, it was, okay, where are our extra cell phones? Where are some old laptops? You know, we were... Um, you know, duct taping it together basically to keep them afloat and relying on neighboring counties to help them. Uh, before we could complete the 2020 uh, primary, we had another situation come up in county government. Again, not an attack directly on the elections office, but we had to find a way to support them too. And so, you know, being a former elections director, uh, county elections director, my brain immediately started thinking, how do we prevent this what can we do to prepare and um and how can we have folks in place as a county director i used to have um, what we called rovers and i remember some of the staff thinking that i had over uh over staffed us with rovers ready to go out and they were making fun one election that they were sitting around twiddling their thumbs and eating our cake and i said they can eat whatever cake chips cookies if they're here in the office it's a good day and so we then thought about, well, what can we do that it's a good day um, if there are future, you know, maybe there won't be future attacks, but if there are, how can we make it a good day? And so that's how we came up with the idea for attack response kits. They are intended to be portable election offices in a box. Um, we don't have the box pictured here, but these are some of the components that are within it. Um, I will say that they are usually uh, cell phones that aren't 
covered with fingerprints um, that we send out. But the components of our arcs, um, we can make it so that it is a small arc or a large arc. So we package it up for five or for 10 uh, systems within the kit. Uh, so that could be 10 laptops or five laptops. So we have, um, we've purchased now Dell laptops um, and have done this over the past year, uh, even through the supply chain issues to have these ready. Um, and that then gives them access uh, to our, our state election management system, which we call SEAMS. Um, we did buy a mouse and a USB and a carrying case, and then the communications kit through Cradle Point um, and a modem. Um, that's where the real expense comes in. You can see up on the screen that that's about $4,800 um, to have that, but that does give them access to the data and voice services that they need. Um, those systems that we picked uh, can last up to two days on battery alone. So this gives us an opportunity when you think about that, it's not just about cyber attacks. We're a state that's faced with hurricanes and other uh, weather issues. And so we can deploy these if we need to um, for even weather hazards. The other components are we keep a stock of cell phones that we can deploy, uh, surge protectors, the crowd strike endpoint uh, services, as well as the uh, threat graph um, and the express support. So we pay for those on a subscription basis. And so total, each kit is less than $10,000, but um, they, they can be a little bit costly, but we have been able to utilize our HAVA funds for, for this measure. And um, we have been able to package those up. Uh, we deploy them across the state uh, in strategic locations so that our field support folks can one, uh, maintain, keep them you know, up to date on their patches and so forth, but they also are accessible to our field support folks who are stationed uh, throughout North Carolina, that they can go and get that kit and get it to a county board office within 90 minutes. Um, that means if, um, you know, whatever stage we are in, in the election uh, season or uh, whatever might be going on, that we reduce our downtime uh, from the event that's taking place. And knock on wood, um, I told you about all those situations happening uh, right then at one time in 2020. Uh, we've created ARCs and they are sitting on dry land. So uh, I will not hopefully have jinxed myself, but um, that's our, our innovative solution um, called ARCs. Hi everybody, Wayne Benna from Nebraska. We're the last panel I know before trivia, but if you pay attention, you could get a pair of Nebraska socks. <laughs> That's how I get you off your cell phones. All right. Uh, so uh, what we're going to talk about is the Voter Accessibility Initiative. And when I proposed this to uh, Amy, I said, this isn't really innovative, but it's something that we should do. Um, and it's something that even with cyber, even with misinformation, we can't lose focus on the basics. And the basics are, if you're gonna vote, you should be able to go to a place that's accessible. And as we know, in many of our rural areas, it can be very hard to find a polling place. And if you have some places to polling place, it might be something that was built a long, long time ago that doesn't necessarily have all the bells and whistles of a brand new building. Also, in those same rural communities, they may not have the money to make those uh, adjustments, but we are required to have accessible polling sites. And so um, this is something that has been very important to me uh, ever since I started as a local election official um, back in the 2010s. Uh, Try to make you sound a little older. Um, and so uh, we decided that we were going to, on the state level, help our 93 counties with identifying issues at their polling sites and providing the resources uh, to be able to work with those polling sites to get upgrades that were desperately necessary. Um, my funding mechanism is um, we decided that the interest off of the HAVA money would be the pool of money we would use for this. Uh, a good portion of our HAVA money has been set aside for the maintenance of our new equipment that I bought right before we got the HAVA money. 
And so I have a considerable amount of money that will be sitting there for a considerable amount of time as we as we pay down the, the uh, maintenance on these current machines. So it's collecting a lot of interest. Um, and so we decided to use uh, the interest from this money uh, to pay for this uh, initiative. So I'll talk a little bit about why this uh, initiative started, what we did, uh, and what we will continue to do. So um, mainly, uh, and I took to the my next slide here, um, so you guys can see that, right? Okay, so I gotta do this. Uh, nearly 25% of Nebraska's population is over the age of 60, and according to the CDC, 20% of Nebraskans over the age of 18 have disabilities impacting vision, hearing, and general mobility. Um, and so I thought, especially during uh, the redistricting year when we were going to have to be changing precincts, I wanted everyone to take a hard look at all of their polling sites. And uh, based upon the timing of redistricting, we had a summer um, to be able to do this. So. Uh, I don't know if you've all heard this, but the census was laid for the first time in the history of our country. Uh, I joke because there, there, there is a dartboard at the Census Bureau with my face on it. I'm, I am sure of it. I think many of you knew I was very vocal and upset with the Census Bureau um, about getting an exact date of, of these on many different calls. Um, like I said, we didn't get to move the election day. So um, I, I'm very lucky that I was able to change the laws and, and cut everybody's time and have to get it done. And I know many of you have, are still going through a trouble. So don't get me wrong. It was my own personal hell for 2021, but I know you guys are still going through it. But as mad as I was, um, I wanted to use the time that the counties were doing, having to do redistricting to take a look at their polling sites uh, along with uh, a member of, uh, of my team uh, that was really interested in uh, doing this. Uh, normally over the summer they would be redrawing their precincts. They didn't need to do that until late fall. So over the summer I wanted everyone to take a look at their polling sites and find out um, where there could be improvements and I had free money and when you hear free money then all of a sudden people get real interested. Uh, so we started this initiative by reaching out to groups that are already doing some of this work. Uh, Disability Rights Nebraska and ARC were two organizations that did polling place surveys and so they would have people come out with a to our polling sites and do a survey on election day to see what was what were some of the issues and they would provide us with reports. Uh, and so they were very excited when we uh, had, I used them in my county and I gave them to all of my d inspectors to tell me what was wrong in, in my county and so I could fix them. But using their surveys and their information was the good starting point so we knew where the problem counties were and you know I, I can only fix what I know. And so uh, these uh, groups were instrumental in, one, providing us information on the front end of where we should go first, and also continuing to go to polling sites every election to make sure and to make sure we're doing our job. The goal was to have every, all, every polling site, you know, ADA compliant by our May primary, which and stretch to, you know, the general election, but to spend a lot of time over the course of a year and a half um, doing whatever we could uh, to help. Um, so most polling sites um, did make, you know, uh, had it met ADA requirements, had good leveled ramps, had ADA parking. Um, others did not. So we have ramps that are uh, not solid and not of the right, correct grade. Uh, a door that was just in the middle of a grassy knoll. Um, something as simple as the grade of a door um, in regards to a wheelchair having to go over the bump. Um, it just wasn't flat surfaced. Or that ramp um, could be doubled as an amusement park ride. Uh, but it was also had the grates at the bottom, you know, like a grill grate. Uh, I know someone doing their best to try to accommodate a wheelchair, but that's not ADA compliant by any means. 
Um, it's also fun to see some of the polling sites I'd never seen before uh, in our county. Uh, I I think this is this Legion Hall was uh, looks like the Alamo, um, but didn't have great parking. Uh, again, also a gravel parking lot in, in this one. And again, it's very difficult sometimes in rural areas to find a building, let alone one that's ADA accessible. So we had added a member of our team um, in 2020 to work with uh, the counties to give them grants uh, for the HAVA money that we had to give back after December of 2020. And after that project was done, she didn't really have much to do. And we asked her, would she be interested in working on a grant program for ADA and traveling the state? Uh, to look at polling sites. And as a person who loves the outdoors and travel, she said, absolutely, yes. Um, and so armed with measuring tools, cameras, and checklists, she would uh, go out uh, sometimes two, three times a, a week to different parts of uh, our state. I will say Nebraska, it's interesting. It, uh, I live in Sarpy County, Omaha, which is the eastern side of, of uh, Nebraska. It takes me less time to get to Madison, Wisconsin than it does the other side of my state. So that kind of tells you how um, long our state is. I was mentioning earlier, one of our largest county, our largest geographic county, Cherry, is larger than the state of Connecticut. So um, there's a lot of vast uh, uh, areas to travel, but she two, three days a week would, would uh, had visited over 500 of our polling sites in uh, 93 counties. So our progress, 40% of our accessibility budget so far has been provided for ADA materials and voting site modifications in more than 40 counties uh, to provide ADA concrete parking pads. Uh, if you think supply chain issues, try to find someone to, to pour concrete nowadays. Um, it was very hard in some of these communities. Automatic door activators, um, I preferred them to fix the door rather than to do doorbells was my preference, but sometimes in some communities you couldn't find a person to redo the door. Uh, we did uh, uh, Braille voting guides, we, had, we provided more ADA voting booths, directional signs, uh, parking signs, uh, and ramps. Um, so if you want it, my I would sign off for it. Um, and so. Um, I was very pleased, um, but also, you know, we told the counties, if we can't fix it, move it. Try to find someplace else. Um, but if you're going to fix it, make sure this place is going to be a polling site for a long time for you. We have a law that if it's if public money is used for the facility, they have to allow us as a polling site. Uh, but some churches or, you know, VFW halls or what have you, they don't have to. Um, but if we're going to make an investment and help them out on things they probably should be doing anyway, make sure that they're going to be a polling site. But if it's way too much, you may want to consider moving the polling site completely. So accessibility is an ongoing priority to our staff. Rural communities with declining and aging populations face challenging of staffing polling sites and maintaining polling sites. And, um, in our state, we do have a, a law that if you're under 10,000, you can't apply for a precinct or all your precincts to go completely by mail. And one of the criteria is, do you have an ADA accessible polling site uh, in that location? And, and more often than not, the, number two, num the two reasons why we would approve a precinct by mail is not enough uh, aging poll workers or poll workers of a particular uh, political party or a non-ADA uh, compliant uh, facility within the, within the um, community. So uh, we are committed to providing access to all voters and additional projects are in various uh, stages of planning. So I wanted to bring this up just because I think some, as I said, we gotta go back to basics sometimes and not forget why we are here um, to help everyone vote and to make sure that um, there are no barriers. Um, I, we were very honored that Unsolicited Disability Rights Nebraska nominated us for a Cleary Award, and uh, we did uh, get one of the 2021 Cleary Awards based upon this project. I will mention we haven't actually received that award, so if, if, you, win, if, you, win an, if you win an award and you don't get it, does it actually exist? Um, I t it's, in, it's in the mail. <laughs> Hopefully not with ballots. Um, 
but uh, we were very, it wasn't expected, not why we were doing it. Um, but uh, this is, you know, as we always say with cyber, it's a marathon without a finish line. So is ADA compliance. Um, it's never going to be perfect. Uh, one last thing that I'll say is, is that we didn't pay for everything. There were like some county courthouses that wanted like huge projects. I'm like, we'll pay for some, but your, your courthouse should be ADA compliant. So we weren't going to pay for a $30,000 project, but we would pay for some of it if you were committed to do that. And that cost share did move some, move the needle uh, a little bit. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to move on. And at the end of questions, uh, then I will do the trivia. So, uh, so you'll have to remember a little bit um, before you win it. So who is next? All right. So my presentation is going to focus on a quality assurance tool uh, that our team worked with uh, some vendor partners to create uh, surrounding the, the redistricting process. So I will say our state is, is not uh, too dissimilar, I don't think, to, to you know, many other states in that we know that over the course of the past couple of years, um, we've seen a uh, increase in personnel turnover and um, uh, as part of that, I think we were probably going into the census with um, or into redistricting with a lot of counties that, that were very unfamiliar with, uh, with the redistricting process and what to do and, and that sort of thing. And, and even our office, we're a relatively young staff. Uh, we had one staff member who had uh, been on staff for a little over 20 years, so she had been through redistricting. This was going to be her third time. Um, and so anyway, last, last year, uh, around the middle of the year, uh, we started going through, going to counties, going to regional meetings and trying our best to do training and, uh, and make sure that we were preparing counties as best we could to do redistricting and to, once they got their maps to be able to update streets in the voter registration database. Uh, but there was one question we kept coming back to. And, uh, and nobody could give me a good answer on it. And nobody could give our team a good answer on it, really. But it's, okay, when counties update, how do we know that they did it correctly? And because there's no way for us to check, just to give a little context, I think a lot of folks know, um, but you know, we're, we've got the second most counties of, of anybody uh, in the country. And so 159 counties. And so there's no way for us to intimately know the data, the redistricting data for 159 counties um, and to know if, if they did it correctly. Um, so just as you know, a, a look at our uh, redistricting timeline, our office began doing intense training with counties in the summer of 2021. Uh, our governor signed off on our state and federal lines in late December, and then our general assembly uh, when they met in January, began signing off on local lines uh, for our counties. And that's really when counties began getting into the voter registration database and updating their voters, updating their streets. Uh, and so at, they, and they started, you know, we told them, hey, look, try to have your lines ready, you know, talk with your county commissioners, try to have your lines ready to be approved as soon as you can so that you can start as early as you can because you have a very narrow window. But again, our concern was, okay, once they update, you know, how can we, how can we reasonably make sure that county election officials have correctly assigned the correct districts to voters? And so based on some knowledge of, of our staff members and things that we have done previously in working with county election offices, um, the idea that we came up with was to, to build a quality assurance tool. Uh, that would provide county election officials a simple and easy tool to use that would flag voters who have incorrect district assignments based on new state and federal lines. And one of my goals of this tool, one of our goals was to, to keep it simple, not let the perfect be the enemy of the good, but to provide something to counties uh, that would be helpful. Because uh, when we're talking about 159 counties, we have some that are very well resourced, uh, some that have really great GIS departments. Uh, and that have really great tools for their election offices. And then we have many uh, that, that don't, that are under-resourced and um, don't really have good GIS or mapping software for, for them to utilize. 
Um, and so what we did uh, was we worked with a couple of vendor partners that I'll talk about in just a second, um, Esri being, being one of those. Um, but we, we developed a tool uh, that could um, take our shape files for our congressional lines, our state house lines, our state senate lines, and then uh, map our voters uh, on, onto that map. And it mapped at over a 99% uh, success rate as far as, you know, I think there were only about 16 or 17,000 voters that weren't able to be, to be put on the map. Um, but they were able to take... Uh, a, a voter file and put voters on a map and then return to us the uh, the specific voters where it appeared to be a discrepancy between the value assigned to them in the voter registration database and the value assigned to them uh, based on where they fell on the map. And so the two vendor partners that we worked with were Esri and then a subcontractor of Esri called Blue Raster. They were fantastic to work with. Um, and, and essentially, uh, what Esri had had built for counties and what was already in place was something that they call their their Esri hub. And essentially, each uh, of our 159 counties um, had a login to a page where they could visualize and they could see and 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 download files that had uh, data that was a result of this process. And I'll show you in just a second what their uh, what each county dashboard looked like but in the early stage of the process so starting in january we in, in in february we started sending to esri and blue raster voter files uh, a couple of times a week because counties were constantly working on their their voters working on their lines and making updates and so we try to do updates as as uh, as, as many times as we could which ended up being about a couple times a week by the time the file got finished processing and we continue to do this for uh, for about three, three and a half, four months or so. And now we're at a rate of about once a week where we're continuing to, um, to, to send new files uh, to, to our vendor partners. Uh, the state dashboard, we had a heat map where uh, when I took this screenshot, this was later on in the process. So uh, the state of Georgia, the counties are all kind of that light orange. Uh, when we first started this process, there was a lot of dark orange on there as counties were getting to uh, getting started on the process. Also on our state dashboard, uh, we had access to tables where we could see, okay, which counties had the highest percentage of voters that need review. Those are the counties that we really need to that we really need to follow up with uh, because it appeared that they had a lot of errors when it came to, um, or a lot of voters to review when it came to uh, voters not mapping correctly on their state and federal lines. We're also able to download files uh, that gave us just specific lists of voters. So if, if we needed to send um, a, like an Excel file with specific voters to counties, we could do that. The county dashboards, uh, this is what the dashboard looks like for a county like DeKalb County, which, which is a metro county. It has about 10% uh, of Atlanta uh, as, as part of it. Um, but you'll see there on the left-hand side, it says district assignments to review its 361 voter records. Um, and then it'll, it breaks that down based on the bar chart for how many of those have a discrepancy with congressional lines, how many have a, a, a House or a Senate um, discrepancy that, that needs to be reviewed. On the map, they could click and they could zoom in to a specific street uh, based on where the point fell and see specifically uh, where the where the line was drawn compared to where the voter was mapping. One of the things that we told counties, um, especially a county the size of the cab uh, that has uh, over a half a million voters, is your number of voters to review is never going to be is probably never going to be zero. Uh, but you need to uh, look at every discrepancy and determine, okay, is this something where you know maybe on the map, the house is in a little bit different spot than the mapping software thinks it is and it's actually correct in the voter registration database um, or is this something where it's incorrect in the voter registration database and you need to fix it uh, and so that's you know that's why we called them uh, records to review and not errors because they weren't always errors and so this is what the county had access to. They could also download files that that gave them a specific list of voters that way in case they needed to distribute that list across their staff, they could do that uh, as well. So every county had a page just like that. Uh, I mentioned uh, that there were multiple files that could be downloaded 
um, as well. And then looking ahead, you know, because this isn't, we, we did take some time to build this tool. This isn't something we want to just use once a decade. Um, but looking ahead, what we're going to start doing is making this process part of our monthly list maintenance. Uh, because I think over, over time, uh, counties will get um, better at using it. And I want to make sure that it becomes kind of a, a, a behavior of theirs to continue to drive them to this, uh, to this hub where as they add streets, as they have new construction, um, whatever it is, they're, they're able to go in. And if there appears to be a discrepancy, identify it on a monthly basis and, and not, you know, wait till the next census to, to do this again. I also think, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to keep it simple um, was because of the short timeline. Um, but also we don't have all the shape files for, you know, county, county lines, county commission lines, school board lines, and that sort of thing. Uh, but in making this kind of more of a long-term solution, one of the things I want to look at is can we over time begin to collect some more of those local lines and get those to our vendors so that counties have access to being able to, to see those on their map also. Uh, so that's, that's the tool that we built. And then if you have any questions, uh, I'll save those to later, but that's my contact info. Hey there, good afternoon everyone. Um, appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit um, with you all. Let's see if we can. So, um, you know, as we can all relate in this room, you don't have to look far to, to find some challenges um, in the election sphere. So um, I'm here to kind of share a couple. We had two really significant um, and unusual challenges. I, I think you all will probably recognize um, one of them, but in particular, um, to share a little bit of context um, as to what the problem was that we were trying to resolve in New Mexico. Um, you know, a little thing called, called COVID-19 hit um, and it, it doesn't go away. So we had some lessons learned from 2020 and ways that we were able to kind of make some improvement to support some of the gaps um, that we had an awareness of. And then also, unfortunately, our state was hit pretty darn hard this, this summer um, with wildfires. So we actually had the, the largest wildfire um, in the history of our state. Um, you may have heard of it um, on national news because it, it really did um, kind of hit, hit us very hard. It was worrisome. Um, but aside from that, there wasn't just one very large wildfire. They were popping up across the state and they were popping up during early voting. Um, so those are the two big problems that um, we were looking for solutions for, and I'm gonna kind of share a couple of tools that we had, um, and, and maybe it'll be something that you can take back with you. So um, hopefully I can, can see my slide here. <laughs> Short and bad vision. Um, but anyway, you know, two things that we were worried about were accessibility, and then really some of the communication challenges that we were gonna have in trying to navigate um, some of these exceptions to the status quo for our voters in the state and, and for our county officials and working with them on training and some of that communication. And, and like all of us, we are always looking to make sure we are sharing information, um, creating policies and procedures with election security and integrity in mind. So those are all of the things that we were really juggling in this, in this case. So we are lucky that our law really provides for an opportunity for emergency response providers, first responders, you know, all of the firefighters and or nurses um, that might be supporting any sort of emergency within our state. We have the opportunity to treat them um, for, for all intensive purposes um, for this group as a, a federal qualified elector. So they um, qualify for um, all of the provisions that most would um, if you were voting overseas or were a member of the military and, and stationed elsewhere. So at a high level, that's really kind of what this process um, was for us. And we saw it utilized you know, by FEMA. I mentioned some of the healthcare providers and just really there are just a few um, basic requirements. So a few of the legislative highlights um, you, you have to be stationed um, outside of the county that you are registered to vote in. You also had to receive kind of emergency orders um, within 35 days of the election. And that order had to come specifically from either the, the president or a governor of a state. It didn't have to be our state, um, but there could be a, a state of emergency in any state within the country that you were supporting. So, so I'll focus first on kind of how that process works. 
Um, so essentially, um, as I mentioned, we have an opportunity for folks to apply for a vote by mail um, or request to vote by mail um, online. So we kind of just enhanced our technology to be able to support this specific group. Um, we made sure that we were making that um, available during that specific window that I mentioned, and really they just had to go online um, and request their ballot, and then they would kind of move through that process as any other um, voter that requested that ballot online. The, the, diff the main difference, right, is that we weren't mailing it to them. Um, we were then kind of handling them in the same way we would a federal qualified elector in that they could receive that electronically and then they could return that electronically. And for our county officials, they would really go through the same process as any other UOCAVA voter. And so then those ballots um, would be reviewed and, and hand tallied. So on to kind of a different issue and a little bit slightly different way of handling it. Um, you know, we had, we had the global pandemic as everyone. Um, I think some of the big pieces there is that it was so unpredictable. Um, it was really hard to know what was coming from one day to the next. And though we had some um, support, I think we have a lot of pro-voter provisions, so that's a positive, but there was still a group that was potentially being missed, right? So um, if you had COVID, um, and, and this applies to any sort of medical issue, really, but in particular, we saw a great need during that window of time. Um, but when you can't get to the polls to vote in person, you know, we have 28 days of early voting. We also have an opportunity, no excuse, um, you know, absentee. So there are ways that folks would be able to participate even in this pandemic. But there was still a group that, you know, missed the deadline or you didn't know you were going to get it. Um, and so you might have been stuck, um, quarantined or hospitalized and, and you didn't plan for that. Um, so for those um, members of our population that were kind of outside of the window to request to vote by mail, um, we did have a specific medical emergency provision that we were able to implement. So if you missed the deadline, and, and our deadline in particular to um, request a, a mail ballot is the Thursday before Election Day. Um, our last day to vote in person early is the Saturday before Election Day. So, you know, it's a small window of time, but we were still seeing um, the need to address voters that missed, missed a couple of those windows and, and just weren't going to make it on Election Day to vote. So we have a specific provision. It, it does require them to participate through a provisional ballot, um, but they were able to request in writing um, through um, their county clerk's office. We, we kind of prescribed a form and they really just needed a healthcare provider to authorize, um, you know, really affirm that they were in that specific circumstance, that they were confined and unable to make it to um, in-person voting. And then they could really in writing also designate a representative and essentially that representative provided for the delivery. Um, they would deliver the request, pick up the provisional ballot, take it to the voter, voter completes it, and back to the county clerk. Um, as long as that was delivered to the clerk, like all other ballots by 7 p.m. on election day or any polling location, um, then those folks were not prohibited from part participating. Um, they wouldn't have had another way to really be able to submit their ballot. And of course, like any other provisional ballot, it's gonna be um, reviewed by a board. There are opportunities to challenge. Um, but essentially, if that person is registered and there is no challenge, then those ballots should be should be counted. So I think that just was kind of um, a couple of tools. Again, it's it's really highlighting a couple of gaps. Um, it's not something you're going to see every day. And I think the population is reasonably small. But um, I think as as we all know, anytime you have to tell someone no or you can't find a way to help support that accessibility, it's always a concern. So we were grateful to really be able to have a couple of different ways of handling these unexpected situations. Um, we're certainly looking at ways to be able to improve upon that. I think with any new provision or something that's not utilized very often, there's always a need to improve on the training aspect, on some of the automation, and mainly communication. Um, you know, with, with anything new, and we might have some new clerks. So we saw some areas for improvement that we're evaluating, but overall, we feel like this has been a, a success and a really helpful thing in our state. So with that, I think we might be ready for questions. 
Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for sharing those um, innovations. Do any members have questions for our panel? I don't know if I'm supposed to ask questions in the last panel today, but I'm going to. Um, Blake, I'm just curious, uh, very cool tool, um, about sort of going forward, you had mentioned additional applications for it, additional district layers. Um, I'm curious, like, what level of feedback or work you had, like, with your state geographic information office on that, and kind of how, how mapped out your state is in terms of um, being spatial and, and available uh, to be imaged, and sort of what, what future work you're, you're sort of seeing with that type of tool in your state, because we're looking at a lot of the same thing. Yeah, so, um, I mean, this project was handled almost exclusively by us. We did, we did work with and communicate early on with our reapportionment office just to make sure that we got the, the correct shape files um, for our federal and state lines. Um, you know, I, I think actually in, in working with our, our reapportionment office, they'll be the ones that'll be able to provide us access to, uh, I think, some, some of the local lines. And so essentially it'll be just, you know, utilizing them to help get any shape files that we can to be able to get those off to the vendors uh, so that they can put them on the map uh, so that counties will have access to, to, that, uh, to that data. Yeah, uh, uh, so did a similar project, like that's an amazing tool you did up there and this might actually work for Michigan as well. Um, if you can get to the lowest level of data, so like precinct splits or parts, um, that'll allow you, if you know the district precinct assignments, you can actually re reverse engineer any, any of those, those data points. So starting off with like precinct splits and if you know what precinct splits are assigned to a city, you could reverse engineer the city, you could reverse engineer any fire district, school, all of those things. So getting to that lowest level uh, of data set and then being able to have a, a trust, trusted source of precinct assignments, um, that would be the way to go. Cool, Th thanks for that. Blake, I had a follow-up question with regard to any feedback you've had from your county election officials about the, the voter registration anomalies. Um, first, to what extent did you find that they were false positives? Whereas you described the, the voter had been assigned to the correct district, but because the legal boundary might be the center line of a street, the voter was 30 feet away from that according to the uh, data, and so therefore we're showing up as an error. Yeah, I don't have an exact percentage for you, but I, I know that it was, uh, there were, there were a very significant number of, of real positives that were that were found and that they were able to correct. Um, it was well over half that were, that were actually errors. Um, and the feedback that we got, honestly, uh, one, one of the things that surprised me a little bit was it came from a lot of our, our middle to, to larger counties uh, that provided feedback and, and you know thought it was a thought it was a helpful tool. Um, because it, I mean, again, it was really easy and being able to identify the voters where there were discrepancies, um, and, and then they were able to, to, uh, to fix them. Um, but the, but the feedback was overwhelmingly positive. Um, and, and, you know, I, I remember when I was at the county level and, I, and I, I was at a county that was fortunate enough to have, um, some good solid GIS, uh, software, uh, and I'm by no means a GIS expert, but it was, um, you know, I was able to look at voters on a map and I was able to zoom in and see the lines and see really where the house fell, you know, if a line split a property or that kind of thing. Um, so, um, yeah, it was, it was overwhelmingly positive, uh, not that many uh, false positives. Uh, like if you look at, if you zoom in on like the DeKalb map, you will see a lot of the points that are still there that are left over or like right along boundary lines, which is exactly what you would expect. Um, but it, it did, um, it, it was, it was very helpful and helped me sleep a little bit better at night because I mean, out of 159 counties, there were, as we got late into the process, um, you know, a handful or, you know, two or three counties that we had to call and say, Hey, you still have a high number of, of discrepancies. And, um, you know, I, I think without this, I don't know how, how we would have really known. Well, thank you. That's very helpful. I just had one follow-up, and that was um, to what extent did you get feedback that 
these misassignment errors were nothing new. They were not the result of redistricting data being updated, but a misassignment made 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, you know, I mean, I, th I think I'm sure that I'm sure that did happen. That there were some that you know it, maybe they were made during the last redistricting, and then and maybe no nobody noticed. I will say that you know we had uh, we had a few instances, especially in rural areas, um, some of our smaller counties where uh, the point was showing up in another county, and what it turned out was you know it was just somebody that had a large piece of land um, whose house was clearly uh, in the county, and and and. You know, it was one of those things that kept coming up every 10 years. And so the county knew exactly, oh, that's, you know, that's Bob. I know Bob. He lives in our county for sure. So we, we had that, you know, come up for sure. Um, but uh, it, it was at a, a relatively low rate. Great. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I did have a question for um, Wayne about the accessibility program. Um, do you, and, and pardon me if I missed this, but do you go back and revisit polling places that, you know, where you've identified issues? Uh, do you go back and reassess problems um, after they've initially been identified or after, you know, they say they're going to implement a solution? Well, we don't pay for it until it's done. Okay. Um, we approve it by, we approve it beforehand, but don't pay for it till it's done. So I know that it has been done because I'm, I can't sign for it until it is. Um, but that's what's working with our partners in the in the disability rights community come in. Um, they actually one of the groups applied for a grant to have someone to do the check and balance on us. Um, so because I can't have you know everyone everywhere on election day, but they have volunteers in every county that will go do that individually and then provide us the feedback to find other things that we may have missed. And um, we had, after our primary, we didn't have, some of this stuff was ongoing. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot from these groups. We expect that they're gearing up for the general election to have a whole lot more um, people out. It was harder in the primary to get folks to come out because COVID was, is, is always still a concern. So people may not want to volunteer to do this. And that's why they didn't even do it in 20. So long and short of the answer, we're, we're, we're working with groups to keep us um, um, in check and help us find other issues that we may not have missed. But uh, we know they've done them because I won't pay for them. So. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you, panelists. We really appreciated hearing from you. So thank you very much. Okay, so for I, I got, I, I broke my own rule. You're, if you have a pair, you can't answer. But Angie, but Angie took care of it and gave it to Brad. So someone else, who I will not mention, Michigan, complained. Um, <laughs> On what, for a pair of socks, what money did I use to pay for this initiative? Interest on the Hava. Who was, who said that? Keith. Don't you have one already? Do you have one already? Okay, all right, congratulations. <laughs> Keith, all right. Welcome to, welcome to the club. Great. Well, that concludes the open session of uh, NASA for the summer. I want to again thank everybody for being here. Um, thank you to all of our corporate affiliates, uh, members of the media, and uh, everyone else that attended. We really appreciated having you here um, along with us to learn about some of the excellent things that are happening around the country in election administration. And I just want to personally thank you all for making the trip here to Madison. I hope you enjoyed your, your time here. We certainly enjoyed having you. So thank you so much for making the trip. Um, and I, I hope to see folks again at our winter meeting, which will be happening in DC uh, February 15th through the 18th. Um, so we hope to see you all again at the next NASA meeting in DC.